One of the main applications of calculus is determining how one variable changes in relation to another. A marketing manager wants to know how profit changes with respect to the amount of spent on advertising. Maybe a physician wants to know how a patient's reaction to a drug changes with respect to the dose. And so this leads to the following uh, definition, which, which we've actually seen many times before, but let's, let's put in the context of calculus now. Let f of x be a function defined on the interval a to b. Then the average rate of change of f of x with respect to x for the function f as x changes from a to b is given by this so-called difference quotient, f of b minus f of a over b minus a. We abbreviate this as delta y over delta x, for which this delta here, uh, it looks like a triangle, but this is actually the Greek letter delpha, delta. You often see it maybe in like a fraternity or sorority or something like that. Uh, it, it's just like the Greek equivalent of a capital D. In this case, delta is short for difference because if we look at like delta Y versus delta X, well, the A and B, these are X coordinates. These are numbers in the domain. So delta X DX is B minus A. This is a difference of the X coordinates as opposed to Delta Y, delta Y, which is F of B minus F of A. F of A, after all, is just the Y coordinate, which corresponds to X equals A on the graph of Y equals F of X. And likewise, F of B is just the Y coordinate of B, of the point associated to B on the graph of Y equals F of X right there. So that's what this means is this difference quotient is just the difference of the Y coordinates divided by the X coordinates. Sometimes you might call this rise over run. That is, rise represents a change of the vertical. If things are rising, they're going up or going down, I suppose, if there's a negative rise. Run, on the other hand, unless you're Spider-Man, well, you have to run horizontally. Uh, and so that's a change of a horizontal displacement right there. Well, rise over run, we've often seen in geometry, this is referring to the slope of a line. This is the slope formula. And this is what we had talked about in the previous video of our lecture series, how the average rate of change measures the slope of a secant line of a function. That's all that average rate of change is about. And so let's take a look at this, not necessarily from a geometric point of view, but let's think of it from more of just a story problem point of view. Suppose a car is stopped at a traffic light. When the light turns green, the car begins to move along a straight road forward. Assume that the distance traveled by the car is given by the function s of t equals 3t squared for the first 15 seconds. So as t is between 0 and 15 seconds, uh, t will be measured in seconds. s of t will be measuring, in, will be measuring distance in feet right here. So what is the exact speed of the car at 10 seconds. So this, this is a very critical question right here because we might be like, okay, if I plug in t equals 10, I would find the distance. Like we can compute what s of 10 is. This is gonna be three times 10 squared, which would be three times 100. We're gonna end up with 300 feet. So after 15 seconds, the car, according to this model, would have traveled 300 feet in distance. And I should mention that this formula here is actually quite, it's a, it's a good formula. This is within the laws of physics and things like this. It's quite quite feasible thing. But we don't wanna know how far it went. We wanna know what its speed is. What is speed in relation to distance? Well, speed, thinking about that, if you have a higher speed, that means you go a farther distance, well, maybe for a fixed point of time. Speed, this is an important thing to keep track of, speed is a measurement of distance per time, right? In the United States, when we drive on the highway or on our roads, we typically are driving a speed me measured in miles per hour. We can often use the units of our scientific measurements here to get some idea of how these things are related to each other. If speed is measured in miles per hour or kilometers per hour or something like that, we have a distance per, in this case means division, per a unit of time. Uh, in physics, you might talk about, so a particle's moving at so many feet per second, uh, such and such. And so speed is going to be this distance divided by time. So really, if we use the average rate of change of our distance function, this is an important thing to remember here. If we take the average, well, let me, let's just use the symbols we had from the previous slide. If we take delta S divided by delta T. So the delta S represents a change of position. The delta T represents a change of time. This is the average rate of position the average rate of change of position with respect to time, this is what one would call average speed. 
So we could we can get a measurement of what the speed is using uh, this delta s over delta t. Now the problem though is if we do try to just compute this, right? If we try to take delta s over delta t, if we do this at the moment where t equals 10, we're gonna end up with s of 10 minus s of 10 over 10 minus 10, which we end up with 300 minus 300 over 10 minus 10, we end up with zero over zero. That's not a speed. Zero over zero is not a number. So that didn't work. The problem is that the difference quotient measures a change of two points. We have to have two different points in time here. So in order to compute the so-called instantaneous speed or the in, what we call the instantaneous rate of change at an exact point in time, we could try approximating the exact uh, we could try to approximate the exact speed using average speed where we make the increments smaller and smaller and smaller. So for example, what if we looked at the the change of s with with the change of t on the time interval, let's say 10 to 10.1. So what if we look at just a tenth of a second from this moment of 10 seconds, right? What if we just look at that small time frame? A tenth of a second isn't very huge. In which case, then we would have to look at S of 10.1 minus S of 10 over 10.1 minus 10. The denominator, of course, is just going to be 0.1. It's just the length of the time interval right there. In the numerator, S of 10, we already did. That's 300. By a similar calculation, if you take 10.1 uh, and you square that, you're going to get, and then times that by 3, you'll get 306.03, like so. Uh, in the numerator, when you subtract those and divide that by 0.1, you'll end up with 60.3. And this will be measuring, of course, feet per second, right? Our distance measurement is in feet, and our time measurement is in uh, seconds here. So we see that the average rate of change will measure the this average speed as feet per second. So in that tenth of a second after 10 seconds, we see that the, av the car's average speed was 60.3 three feet per second. So that's an average. That doesn't tell you how fast it was at 10 seconds, but it gives you an approximation. It's gonna be somewhere close to 60 feet per second. But you know what? Why do we use a 10th of a second? Why don't we try like a hundredth of a second? If we take T of S over T, uh, Delta T, excuse me, Delta S over Delta T, as you range from 10 seconds to 10.01 seconds, if we use a smaller unit of time, we're gonna get S of 10.01 minus S of 10 over 10.01 minus 10 here. Well, the denominator will be a one hundredth of a second now. And then the numerator, you're going to take S of 10.01, which would be 10.01 squared times that by 3. You get 300.6003 minus the 300. That'll simplify become 60.03 feet per second like so. So as we shrunk the time interval, we got closer to the true value of the speed at t equals 10, which we can see that our first estimate was 60.3, then our next estimate was 60.03. Well, why stop there? Why not take the time interval to be even smaller? What if we take one thousandth of a second? So we go from 10 seconds to 10.001 seconds. How would that affect things? A smaller time interval? That's a really small small time frame right there, one thousand, one one thousandth of a second. So we'd have to do S of 10.0001 minus S of 10, just so we're clear. Um, whoops, that's a one right there. Uh, let me use a different color, 0 0.01. If we put that into S, we're gonna see that it turns out to be 300 point zero six zero 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 three. As we know, S of 10 is 300. And then the denominator looks like 10.11,000 minus 10, which the difference will be 11,000. And so when you compute that, simplify that fraction, we'll end up with 60.003 feet per second. And so what we're seeing here is the following pattern. What seems to happen as T approaches 10, we seem to be getting that delta S over delta T is approaching 60 feet per second. Now, of course, 60 feet per second is roughly around 40 miles per hour, which is quite reasonable speed for a car. And so that seems very plausible, right? And so notice this idea that we're shrinking the interval down, down, down. We're approaching closer and closer to 10 equals 10, 10 seconds exactly, right? We can't just plug in 10 as the left bound and the right bound, who's got zero over zero. But if we make the interval smaller and smaller and smaller, we can better approximate the exact speed at 
10 seconds. If this process sounds familiar to you at all, that's because this is the limit process. This is what limits are all about. In order to calculate the best approximation, because after all, we're rounding to 60, but this is not the right answer necessarily. To find the best approximation, we really want to take a limit. And so what's the limit that we're considering right here? What we should be considering is the so-called instantaneous uh, speed, which is would be denoted ds dt at 10 seconds. This is going to be the limit. This is the limit as delta t approaches zero of delta s over delta t. So we want the denominator to go to zero when we calculate this. So uh, and then not t equals zero, sorry, t equals 10. We want to figure out what happens at 10 seconds right here. And so if we if we pull this apart from what we saw above, let's say that, uh, we well, we have this s of 10. We need to do 10 seconds. But then we want to be something a little bit bigger than 10. So let's take s of, say, 10 plus h, where h is just a little bit bigger than 10, like we were doing before. h was 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.02. And so therefore, the denominator is going to look like 10 plus h, that's the second timestamp. The first timestamp is going to be 10. And so in this situation, we can then say, let's calculate the limit as h approaches 0 right here. And so if we, we can't just plug in h equals 0 here, you'll notice that the denominator simplifies just to be an h, the 10 minus 10, they cancel out there. We see that. Uh, with the function, we don't necessarily get that cancellation. We get s of 10 plus h minus s of 10. But s of 10, we know that to be 300. And so we need to figure out the limit as h approaches zero in this situation. Well, perhaps like other limits of difference quotients we've seen, perhaps we could simplify this, this quotient in order to calculate the limit exactly. All right? So let's take s of 10 plus h for a moment. Let's consider that. Well, the function s of t was 3 times t squared. So we're going to get 3 times 10 plus h squared minus 300 all over h as h goes to zero like so. Let's expand the numerator just by foiling that thing out. You're going to get 3 times 100 plus, and you're going to get a 20h plus h squared. If you go through the details of the foil, you can see where that came from. This all sits above h as h approaches 0. Notice here we could distribute this 3 through, and if you distribute the 3 through, you're going to get 3 times 100, which is 300. That's going to cancel with this 300 that's right there. And so what didn't get canceled out? We end up with a 60h plus 3h squared all over h, taking the limit as h approaches 0. The numerator, because we, we still have that division by 0 in the denominator. We don't want that. So what we could do is we could factor the numerator, recognize that everyone in the numerator is divisible by h. This seems like a pattern we've seen somewhere before. You get 60 plus 3h all over h. And so we're going to cancel out that h there. But notice we're still taking the limit as h approaches 0. But now in this situation, because the division by h is in the, no longer the denominator, the division by 0 is no longer a problem. Using continuity of limits, we then get that the limit as h approaches 0 will be 60 plus 3 times 0. And so we end up with the limit being 60. That is 60 feet per second, like we were estimating it was going to be from before. So in summary, what we just saw from that example is that the instantaneous rate of change for a function x when x equals a is the limit here, the limit as x approaches a of f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. So you'll notice what we see right here. So a is our sort of our target value. We want to get close to x equals a. But we can't just plug in x equals a there uh, because we'll end up with 0 over 0. These difference quotients always look like 0 over 0. So we're taking a small perturbation of a. That is, we just go a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left of a. This is a small amount. We call it h right here. And we get this formula right here. But, of course, alternatively, we could define the instantaneous rate of change to be more closely resemblant of the average rate of change form we saw earlier. This would give you something like this, the limit as b approaches a of f of b minus f of a over b minus a. I want you to convince yourself that these two definitions are exactly the same thing. Because we're just because notice the bottom right here, right? H is just the difference of b minus a. H just measures how close a and b are to each other. So if I add a to both sides, you're going to see that a plus h is equal to b. And so you see that right here, a plus h and b, those are identical. And then h versus b minus a, they're the same. So if you want it to look like the slope formula, you can. 
But from practice, when it comes to simplifying difference quotients, having just a single H in the denominator is typically going to be an easier algebraic chore than having the more straightforward slope variance. But all both of these will give us the instantaneous rate of change of a function. Now, if we return to another question about distance and speed, the instantaneous speed of an object is going to be the limit of the average speeds. Or in, in physics, more properly refer to this thing as the velocity of the object. What's the difference between velocity and speed? Well, speed itself is a signless number. There's no such thing as negative speed. You can drive either 30 miles per hour forward. You can drive 30 miles per hour back. The speed is still 30 miles in, in, uh, in both directions. On the other hand, velocity is the signed speed. That is, it's speed with a direction. Um, speed's always positive, in which case instantaneous speed, average speed, those are always going to be positive numbers. But velocity could be positive or negative. So if we're driving forward in the positive direction, we'd call that positive velocity. If we were driving backward, what we say is the backward direction, we'd call that a negative velocity. So if we get positive or negatives, that's okay. Driving, you know, 10 miles per hour negative just means we're driving backwards, 10 miles per hour. So that's the difference between velocity. It's a, it's a more precise uh, quantity when it comes to science. So if you hear us talk about velocity, it's essentially the same thing with speed, but it also has direction built into it. So the distance and feet of an object from a starting point is given by the function s of t is given to 2t squared minus 5t plus 40, where t is measuring time in seconds and s of t is measuring distance in feet. Now, again, don't worry about the derivation of these formulas. Where do these formulas come from? These are reasonable formulas that one can get from application of physics, uh, particularly, you know, Newton's law of motions and things like that. So don't worry about that. Uh, just, just this is a mathematics course. So let's just focus on the mathematical side of things. Don't worry about the origin of these equations. These are reasonable uh, physics, physical equations for these type of settings here. So let's find the average velocity of the object as it goes from two seconds to four seconds. If you want the average velocity, Average velocity, we'll call delta S over delta T. The delta here represents a distance, and then we have a difference quotient right here. So this is going to look like S of 4 minus S of 2 over 4 minus 2. When it comes to average rates of change or average velocities, I always prefer the more slope approach to these things. So what is going to be S of 4? We're just going to plug 4 into our function into these locations, right? So you get four squared, which is 16 times it by two. You get 32, four times, uh, let's, so we have 32 there. Five times four is gonna be negative 20 there, plus 40. So when you add those together, we end up with 52 when we're nice and done. So we're gonna get 52 right here. Similar thing if you plug in two, if you plug in a two here and here, you're gonna end up with eight minus 10 plus 40, for which case you get a 38. In that situation, let me erase that. And this is over the difference of time, 4 minus 2. And so combining those things, 52 minus 38 is 14. And 4 minus 2 is 2, which simplifies to be 7. 7 what? As these are story problems, units are very critical in this application. Our speed is going to be measured in 7 feet per second. That would be the average speed of our object. We don't even know what it is. Some particle, something's moving, but seven feet per second is how quickly it's moving. Now, on the other hand, we might ask ourselves, what's the instantaneous velocity at four seconds? So in the instantaneous velocity, we can't use the difference quotient by itself because if we try to take the difference quotient delta S over delta T, when, uh, when you take T here to equal four, well, you're going to get S of four minus S of four over four minus four, you're gonna end up with zero over zero. You can't do much with that, but zero over zero suggests to us we need to take a limit. So instead, the instantaneous velocity, will denote this as ds dt, as t is equal to four. Even better, this is abbreviated as v, v for velocity here. This is gonna be the limit, the limit as h goes to zero of, of the function. We're gonna take s of four plus h minus s of four, and this will sit above H. So we want to simplify this difference quotient right here. So the function S, which we saw above, remember that's 2T squared minus 5T plus 40. So we need to put that in. We have to replace all the T's with the 4 plus H. So to do that, we're going to get 2 times T squared. So we replace the T with 4 plus H. We're going to square it. 
Then we get minus five times t. The t will be replaced with a four plus h. And then we're gonna get a plus 40, like so. We need to subtract from that s of four. S of four, we already calculated on the previous part, and that's gonna be 52 feet. And then the denominator turns out to be an h, as h goes to zero. So our goal is to simplify the numerator so we can find a factor of h that can cancel with the h in the denominator. So we need to expand the numerator to combine some like terms. That's, what's, that's what our goal is gonna have to be. So take the four plus h, foil that out. You're gonna get 16 plus eight h plus h squared. Uh, distribute the negative five right there. You're gonna get negative 20 minus five h. And then you're gonna get a positive 40 minus 12. I guess the 40 and the, and the negative 52 could combine together. That'll give us a negative 12 at this venture over h. Um, we could also combine together uh, this negative 20 and this negative 12 right there. That's gonna give us a negative 32 right there. We have a negative five h. And then distribute the 16 on, or excuse me, distribute the two onto the 16, the 8h and the h squared. Uh, you're going to get a 32. You're going to get a 16h. And then, oh boy, should have squeezed it in there a little bit better. You're going to get a 2h squared right there. Still, as we're taking the limit as h goes to zero, all above h. Now, notice what happened to our constants. We had a positive 32 that cancels with a negative 32. All the constants canceled out. That's so amazing. It's not a coincidence. Uh, please don't take my animation to think any more than sarcasm here. Uh, we see that what, what didn't get canceled out, we have a 2h squared. Um, we have a 16h minus a 5h. That's going to give us an 11h. And this will then sit above an h like so. So factoring an h from the numerator, because everyone's now divisible by h. You can take out an h, leaves behind a 2h plus 11. This sits above the h as h goes to 0. Cancel the factor of h from the denominator and the numerator there. And so now we're left with a 2h plus 11, which if we send h to zero how now, there's no division by zero problem. We'll end up with two times zero plus 11, which then tells us that our object is moving at exactly 11 feet per second. So above, right, we saw that the average, the average speed delta s of delta t as we went from two to four, that turned out to be 14 feet per second, which relatively speaking was a good estimate of 11 feet per second. But the thing is we shrink the interval from two to four. If we, if we slide two closer and closer and closer to four, when we take the limit of this approach, we'll see that the instantaneous velocity was 11 feet per second.